Uh, let's go ahead and read the word of the Lord, God's holy inspired word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was, was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him and without him, not one thing was created, which has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness, but the darkness does not comprehend it. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of information going on here. A lot of information. So what I'm going to do is we're just going to slowly work through the text. We can ask questions. We can make observations. I will highlight things. You can stop and interrupt me. And, and my prayer for us this morning is really to understand, uh, in, I'm saying origin, but there is no origin as we, as we will see in the word, in, this, in the son of God. But, but we're going back to the beginning in Christology to look at who G the Lord Jesus Christ was, is, will be, okay? And, I, and, I'm, and, and, and I'm in many ways, maybe I should say was, is, and is to come. <laughs> maybe I should be more careful with my language, quoting from, from the revelation of Jesus Christ, God's, uh, John's apocalypse. So let's look here. Let's look here at now the text. Okay, so first thing I notice is this phrase, uh, in the beginning. This is a prepositional phrase, and this, of course, gives us time. And so in stating this in John 1.1, 1, 1, what does this allude back to in Genesis? What, what does it cause us to think about, anyone? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, right? And this, this goes back to the beginning of time, right? At the beginning of creation. Okay. And notice this now. Okay. So we have, we have a time reference there. We're expecting John to say in the beginning, God created, right? That's what we're expecting, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how, that's how Genesis 1, 1 begins. But notice that we don't have any reference to creation until verse number three. So, so whereas Genesis 1-1 begins with God creating all things, right? We have here, as it were, before the creation of all things. And, and the way that we can know this, we're using a specific word before the creation of all things, is that it doesn't say in the beginning is the word in the very beginning was so this is already we, we this is a that we could say this is a state of a state of uh verb and this is this is past really it's like imperfect imperfect tense in the beginning was so this, so if, if we're, if we're thinking, if, so state of means state, think of state. I am, I am hungry. I'm in a state of hunger, of hunger. It describes my current reality. I am, I am, I am thirsty. I am tall. I am short. I am hairless, right? Those are describing current present states, but here, this is a past, a past imperfect. That, that's a, a past ongoing action. So combining these two, we can say this is pre-existence. Pre-existence without origin. There's no origin of the word. Everyone tracking there with me? Is that the same with preeminence? Uh, no. So, so preexistence means that there is just, it, uh, he existed in the past without any reference to an origin. Okay. Preeminence means he is above 
he, he, he's above all things in that he is a uh, superior to all things. So that's the difference. Preeminence is an issue of, of status. Preexistence is reference to time. So let's be clear. In the beginning was, and then the, the actor, or we could say it's not really action, but the subject, the subject that that's being focused upon is the word. In the beginning was the word. So there is no origin described in the word. And we're going to, we're going to further clarify what he means by that. Okay. So this is going back before the creation event. And so we can, we can write here. What, what is this going? What is this? What is this sentence generally being described? We could say this is a description. This is description. Number one, description. Number one, incredible, powerful, and so now what we want to do here is we want to think about a word study analysis and thinking about why the, the word is being used. We're, we're going to put a hold on that. Um, literally in the Greek, it's, it's logos, the word, and there's different views on what this is. And so we want to think about this, at why this would be used, what's the purpose behind it. But let's just put a hold on that right now, okay? Now watch this, okay? Next we have we have a conjunction here, okay? And so this is a this is a, a conjunction and this is this is connecting. So the the two ideas are very closely connected. So there's a there's a close connection here, okay? And so and we have the same subject the word we have another state was, and now we have a new qualifying phrase, was with God. We could say this is an association with, association with, with God, or we could think of to be clear, right? So if I'm in association with someone, you know, I am with Bethany, right? There is this, I, especially here, there is this idea of, of presence. He's in the presence or in the fellowship with God. So this further emphasizes not only is the word beyond time and space, just pre-existing, he's in close relationship with God, in close relationship. And we want to be very clear here. This is, this we can identify as God, the father. Okay. And this is confirmed in John. 1 18. Okay. And we'll come back to this when we talk about the incarnation. Okay. So the only son who is at the father's side in his bosom has revealed the father to us. Okay. But we're going to study that later when we get to the incarnation. Okay. At this point, we would just want to highlight there is this incredibly close relationship. So the word is not some random uh, deity, you know, somewhere else as if just other, other things existed, right? It's this incredibly close relationship. The next thing we want to see here. Um, well, so, so then let, so then this is a, this is, so then we could say here that this is description number two of who the word is, right? So this is, we could say this is describing or defining who this word is. So there, so then we could look at looking at the relationship between one A and one B. Clearly, this has to be an idea of this is a, a progression here. If you're looking at the left, the left of my screen, maybe the right of my screen, I'd have to see how it goes. But it's 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 a progression here. Okay. Progression. Uh John is moving towards a, a truth that he's going to tell us. Okay. So number one. The word is in the beginning. Number two, the word was with God. The word was God. So you have here, big idea here, you have pre-existence, which is, which is something that only God has. Two, you have 
close association. And you see how this is building, right? You see how this is building, okay? Now it would make no sense because, so we're gonna get into people's, we're gonna talk about different interpretations here. Um, and so looking here, number three, if, if, if we can, let, let's write this down here. We have, we have a description here, description number three. And we also have another and. This is also connecting. And it also seems to be building, okay? This also seems to be building here, okay? So we have another progression, and that's typical of the conjunction, okay? So uh, what, what does this God what does this God mean, right? What is this the implication here? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. The word was, thinking about here, right? Is this building? Is this, is this building towards a climax? That's my question, okay? So the, the text seems to be building towards a climax, right? That, that's, that's John's sense, okay? Now, this is how, and this is probably one of the most fundamental passages in the Philippines. This is so fundamental for Mormons for Jehovah's Witnesses, for Iglesia Ni Cristo, for um, uh, <laughs> Apollo Kibaloi, a lot of different false teachings, not just in historical uh, Christianity with, with heretical teaching, but also so much in the Philippine context. So this passage is so fundamental for your context, okay? So look here, the options that we can interpret is, number one, we could say that this is, this is a God. And so this is not saying that Jesus, the, the word is the God um, Almighty, but he's just a God. And so does that kind of build to a climax or is it kind of a letdown, right? Because clearly in number two, God is the father, right? So it's like he was in the beginning, pre-existing just like God. He was with God. Ah, he's just a God, right? It's kind of like a huge letdown, right? So that's, that is not the only argument I have. But, but there's, this is a, a cumulative case, but it does really kind of set the stage. Like, what is John saying here? Like, it, it seemed that would be to interpret it like that is a letdown. Okay. So one people have interpreted it as, as a God, they've also interpreted as just, he's divine. Jesus is just divine and it concerns just his nature, okay? Um, and so they would say Jesus is, is, is God as in the nature. Um, and there's multiple people that take this position. And then the third option is that this is God. And so then the interpretation would be that this is, that this is the monotheistic, eternal, Almighty God, we are monotheists. There's only one God. So how do we answer this question? Because I am going to bring the Greek only up only because um, of the the issues with those false uh, cults. So so I'm gonna I am gonna pull the Greek up here so that you can see, and I'll just explain where they're getting what they're getting, and then we'll discuss. Okay, it is helpful. So just very briefly here. The issue here is that here you can clearly see um, this is this is the second um, this is the second uh, phrase. So you have and 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 you can watch it. It'll track both sides. So you can you can watch it track. So and the word was with and then here the God. So this is clearly articular. There's an article the. Uh, although it's not translated, it's referring to God the Father. So the word was with. God article, and then the, the, the third clause here, and God, no article, and Arthras was the word, okay? And so what people, what, what, what the false cults will say, see, there's no article here. See how there's an article there? You can see at the bottom, it says the. So they'd say, because there's no article here, then this must be translated a God. Is everyone tracking with, with, with that argument? Let me take a pause so that you can, you, can, you can see that. Is everyone tracking there with that? There's an article here, God, almighty God. Here, there's no article. It must be a God. 
That's how you translate. Is, is everyone tracking there with me? You don't have to know Greek to see this, okay? The, the problem though, is that just on the face of it, there's, um, that would presuppose that whenever you have the article, you have to be referring to the God. It can't be, it can't be translated a God, okay, or, or God, all right? But, but that's not the case. And, and just right in the verse alone, we can, we can prove that. We have here in the beginning, right? In the beginning, there's the the, right? There's no article here. <laughs> Is everyone tracking there? Let me just take a pause. So everyone sees here. So here, there's an article, God, God the Father. Here, there is no article. But here as well, in, in, the, in the beginning, there's no article as well, but we translate it in the beginning. Is everyone tracking there with me? Does it make any difference if in the English there is um, the and in the Greek there is none? Yeah, so what I'm trying to say is it doesn't. It depends on the context and what's being said, okay? That's what I'm trying to say, okay? But what, 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 what the, the cults will say is because there's no article in Greek, it has to be a God, right? And, and what I'm saying is no, that's not necessarily the case because even in Greek here, you have in the beginning, but there's no Greek article here. <laughs> so if they're going to apply the rule fairly, it shouldn't be in the beginning. It should be in a beginning. <laughs> Does everyone, everyone see? So if, if they're going to, to fairly in, use that as a rule, they should say in a beginning was the word. And obviously we're like, no, that's nonsensical. And even in Greek structure, it doesn't fit. Okay. So, in, yeah. In, in, in our understanding of the statutory construction, when you use the word, the article da, yeah. it is specific. If you use yes. the, the article a, it is generic. Yes. It, so in English, that's the case. But in Greek, it's not the case. So there's many examples where the, the Greek article is not used, but it's, it's clearly specifying one person. So here's a classic example. To, to also prove that. Let's go back to, to Hebrews, Hebrews 1, 2, okay? Um, in these last days, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, okay? So clearly, it's not a son, it's, it's his son. It's, it's, it's a specific person, right? But when you go to the Greek, there's no article here, in son, <laughs> So I'm not saying it's a son. I'm saying it's his son. It's the son. The, the, not having the Greek article has no bearing on how we translate it as his or the or a son. That's what I'm trying to say. So with, 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 to be clear, heretic, uh, heretical positions will take English syntax and read it back into Greek. Because we have to have the the or, a, or an an to be article or indefinite, they're taking our, our contemporary grammatical structure and reading it back into Greek. And what I'm saying is in Greek, that's not how the articles work. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? And you have that in, you have that in Tagalog as well, Biba. You don't, you're, you're art, you don't have articles like in English, correct? So, so that's why that's why we can't apply English grammar to other languages. <laughs> we have to look at your language. We look at Tagalog. We look at Waray Waray, and we we develop our understanding of grammar in relationship to your structure, not in relationship to what English says. And so, in Greek, we don't look at English structure and reinterpret it back. Okay, and that's what they're doing. The same thing in Latin. In Latin, there is no articles. There is no articles. It's just context. So it just, it just, it's just, it's a very superficial, simplistic, and and it's a bad, it's a bad translation. Okay, it's a bad translation. And so you can clearly see it here. It's not a son. It's 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 his son or the son. He has spoken to us in the last days by the son, his son. There's um. Um, those are the two possibilities. No one's interpreting this by us, son. It's not happening. Okay. Same principle, same principle, theme. If when we interpret laws that are taken from Latin or whatever is the main source 
or uh, whatever language. If there is confusion as to the translation into English, we go back to the original, whether it's exactly. in Spanish or Latin. That's why there are so many. That's why there are so many legal phrases that are in Latin or Spanish, so that the the correct context is actually said and is actually stated because the English has a different construction exactly. in grammar or grammatical construction. Yeah. That's the point. No, it, that is that is a parallel. That's a parallel to what we're doing here. That's a parallel to what we're doing here. That is an excellent illustration. Thank you, Kuyo Boboy. That's why you're in the class. That's why you're in the class, so for sure. So, so what we can say definitively, just for review, is that this is a, a bad interpretation or translation because it's reading English grammar back into Greek. It's not looking at Greek syntax and grammar and then formulating. That's the big idea, okay? You're taking English and you're just as if I, you were to be saying something in water and I'm correcting you from English. It's like, no, that's not like, what are you, you can't do that. Like, what I, what I stands on its own. We interpret it within what I, what I, we don't interpret it with, within English. Okay. All right. So, so this, this is out that uh, options. <laughs> Not, not possible. And I can actually post other examples. There's examples. I just gave you the sun example in Hebrews one. There's examples throughout John's gospel where it's, it's clearly speaking to it's articular um, God, son of God, but there's no article. Okay. We would never interpret it a son of God. It's the son of God. Okay. So there are many other examples that just really show that those who interpret this are not understanding the, 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 the context. And then when it comes to divine nature, I, I reject this as well. And the reason why I, reje I reject it is because there is, there is language in Greek that could be used that speaks to nature and not God himself. Okay. Um, it's it, it, like, so for example, in English to, to say that you are to have the, the God's nature you would say God's nature, or you have the divine nature, or you are divine, right? You're godlike. You would not say you are God, right? That's an inappropriate use of the word God in English, okay? There's other adjectives and other nouns that I can use to describe someone having divine nature. Is everyone tracking there with me? Suppose, suppose the description of a man is godly. Will that be a, yes. a bad uh, No, uh, you, you would never say... A man is God, you'd say a man is godly. He's like God, right? That's another example. So we could say divine, you could say godly, but you would, you would never use the word God because it's, it's using the wrong language, okay? So let's look here. I'm, we're going to look up the word God, and I just want to show you other words that should have been used if, if divine was the sense, okay? Um, because even in saying divine, it's not getting us to the climax, right? To say he's divine, like, we already know that he's pre-existed. Obviously, he has to be divine in some sense. Like, there's no coming to the climax of what John is saying. Number one, number two, grammatically, the perspective of word meaning it doesn't fit either because he doesn't say divine. And so let's let's look at several examples of, of what I'm referring to here. So when I look up this word in a dictionary, I can do it right here. Um, uh, so we can look up the, uh, uh, theos. This is a transcendent being who exercises extraordinary power. So this is a deity, God, or goddess. So, so theos can be used in a non-Christian sense to describe other gods, whether like we would say in English, God's lowercase, right? So in this sense, we could say, uh, looking to the right, in English, we have lowercase gods referring to other deities, whether they're real or not, doesn't matter, right? But it's, it's referring to not divine, not characteristics, but a deity, okay? And then you have here God in Israelite Christian monotheistic perspective. So within the within the monotheistic perspective or framework, when we use the word God, we're only referring to the monotheistic perspective. Okay, so this is this is with special reverence or respect. This is that which is transcendent. So again, this is dealing with with um, God like. Let's look at one example just so that you can be clear of what I'm saying here. So this example here. And the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you like God. Okay. So like Elohim. So again, it's, 
it is God, but it's, it's not, it's, it's a comparison. Okay. But it's not divine nature. It's God. It's you're being like God himself. Is everyone tracking there with me? I hope this making sense. So it's still using God in, in that noun unique sense, but it's in a comparison context. Okay. So let's do this. So I'm going to look here at a, another dictionary, and this gives us other words that could be used. So in talking about supreme supernatural beings, theos is what would be used, okay? Theos is what would be used. If you're talking about supernatural beings, creator, sustainer of the universe, you're using theos, okay? God. But then if we want to talk about his nature or just divine nature, there's other words in Greek that can be used. So, so atheos, atheos without God, right? But you still see that root there, theos, God, okay? But look look here. Let's go down here to another example here. We can look at uh, theotes, theotes, or theon, right? These are derivatives of God, but speak to God's nature or, div- or state of being of God divine nature or being is everyone tracking the way so it's not god it's divine okay but it's a different word theotes not theos theon okay is everyone tracking there with me everyone's tracking so that's why coming back to the text here the word that's not being used it's not divine it's not god's nature I'm using translations now into English. It's just using God. There's other words to be used. It's not using God-like. These were not the choices done by John. The choice is, is God. So from, so from grammatical, so we can have a, so what I'm arguing for, there's, there's several reasons from a, from a, a structure, right? The structure, it's building to the point that what he's saying is the word is God. So from a structural perspective, the, the, the context you're seeing, it's moving towards the word was God, right? From a uh, lexicon or dictionary meaning, it's God, <laughs> right? So the word that was used was God, okay? And then from a Old Testament context, we clearly have Genesis 1 to 2 in view. And so this is a, 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 a monotheistic, it's not a, plur, a pluralistic context. The, the broader context of John 1, verse 1, is an Old Testament context in which there is a monotheistic eternal God. Is everyone tracking there with me? So for these three fundamental reasons, in the context, lexically, right? Word study, God was chosen. Structure, uh, uh, it's moving towards that the word is God. And then from a a, uh, Old Testament context, from the scriptural framework, There's no other God in creation. And we're going to further confirm this. Okay, we're going to further confirm this. But for these three reasons, we need to understand the word was God, the monotheistic God of the Old Testament. All right. But looking here, there's association. So there is a a difference it's not just there's one God and the word is just another rev- it's another manifestation of that one God. There is a difference or, or a second person. So that's why there's one God. And then obviously this is Christology. So we're not accenting on the spirit. So in this, so if we're just looking at the word's relationship with God, we would say that it's the second person of the Trinity. Okay. Everyone tracking there with me. And then look at this. There's this summary statement. Now people will say it's a chiasm. I I think it's just progressing to a climax. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. 
The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Okay. So there is still this, there is a distinction. There is a distinction between persons here. How else would he do it? How else would you describe one God in this context, two persons? Obviously, the spirit is included. We could use other texts to, to, to discuss that. But here, how would you say that there is one God, but in this context, two persons? I don't see how, how, any other way. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want to use the article because if you use the article, and so the question is, why wouldn't they use the article? And so there, there's grammatical reasons they say why they don't use the article, and, and we, we, could, we could look at those reasons. Um, because I would say fundamentally, why is there no Greek article being used? Because there is a distinction here. There is a distinction here, okay? If he just says the word was the God, then it's just saying he's the same person. But the reason for not using the Greek article is so that he would distinguish between God the Father, God the Son. And however else, however else you understand this, so then let's go to the fourth, the fourth answer here. Broader context. And so you couldn't make a conclusion. And so we're going to go to John 1.18. You couldn't make a conclusion in John 1.1 1, 1 that contradicted later on the context if we agree in the inspiration and fallibility. Of, if, you, if you disagree with in, in, inspiration of Scripture, fine, this doesn't hold. But if you're holding to the inspiration and fallibility of the Scripture, then your agreement has to agree with the succeeding context. So let's go really briefly to John one. 18. Look at John 1 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. And this, and this also solidifies the articular issue. No one has ever seen God. There's no article here. <laughs> no one has seen the God, but there's no article. So this, if, 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 if they were going to be consistent, they would say, no one has ever seen article God. There's no, there's no Greek article, right? Um, and there's no article, English article here, but th there's clearly only one God. They didn't, they're not translating it. No one has seen a God, right? And, and that, that just really shows that the whole thing falls on its head. No one has ever seen God ever. Okay. The only God, the one who is at the father's side has made him known. Okay. So, um, there's, there's a textual debate here. Is it the only son or the only God? That's, all, that's for a different issue. The point we're bringing out here is that there's God the Father and God the Son. <laughs> no one has ever seen God the Father. The only God, God the Son, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known to us. So there are four fundamental reasons why we interpret Je John 1 verse 1 C as God and not a God or not divine. It's based on these reasons right here. Number one, the structure. Structure now, it's moving towards the climax that, that the word is God. Number two, the, the lexicon dictionary meaning. It's God. It's not divine. It's not God-like. It's God. Okay. Number three, the Old Testament context is in primary view here. Okay. Well, three, the broader context and that, and that broader context is the monotheistic eternal son of God. And then number four, the broader context, John 1 18 clearly clarifies what John the evangelist is saying. I want everyone to understand this, but these are the four reasons why John 1 1 is saying that Jesus is the word. He is God himself, one God in essence, but he's the second person of the Godhead. Okay. So, so maybe we have really belabored this point. One of the most, if not the most, maybe the most, I'll, I'll go with Luther on this, the most fundamental passage in all the new Testament, strongly and definitively describing the word Jesus Christ, obviously Jesus Christ is, 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 is going to be born, but, but the word, the second person of the Trinity as God himself, okay? So let's go back to Genesis chapter one to look at that, okay? And we're also going to define, we'll be defining 
the word at this point. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So literally, we've stopped. <laughs> we've just looked at that phrase in the beginning. Okay, so we're not even dealing with the creation event yet. Verse 4 is going to be, uh, verse 3 is going to be the creation event. So we haven't even gotten there yet, okay? So um, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the, the surface of the waters. We would understand the Spirit of God as being the third person of the Trinity, Henry. Okay. Where is Jesus in this con in Genesis chapter one? Where is Jesus in this context? Okay. If we identify as rightly, John has said, in the beginning was the word. Looking over here, okay? The word, let's let's define this. This is um, speech. So actually, John Calvin uses the word speech. God's uh, speech, eternal, okay? And so we can think of Jesus is the word of God, okay? But it's not an inanimate, in our language, words are inanimate, right? So again, we're looking at the eternal. From our finite perspective, we're looking up at the eternal, okay? So there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation. We're, 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 we're dealing in analogy and fallen analogies, okay? So in the context of, of the creation event, then God said, that's where the son is. God's speech, God's word. So that's why I had you look for the action words, because Jesus is all over Genesis 1 in God's speech. He's the word. So God said, let there be light, and there was light. Um, God called the night day, and the darkness he called night. Okay, look at this again. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and separate the waters from the waters. Then God made the expanse. So throughout the New Testament, Jesus is the means, the agent by which God creates the world. So, so Jesus is not only in God's speech, God said, the word of God. He's also in the action God made. So God made the expanse through his son. Does everyone see that? So, so Jesus is present wherever those verbs, wherever those action words are mentioned, Jesus is present there. The spirit is present in one too. And then, and then rightly so, 126, maybe I'm jumping ahead of myself. Then God said, let us make man. God is speaking to the spirit and to the word. <laughs> so that's, the, that's where the son, the second person of the Trinity is in the creation of the world. Okay, so let me, let me quote. I want to quote someone here saying this. Just give me one second. I want to quote this. Here we go. So this is, this is a reform commentary. I, um, uh, Phillips, I believe it's Richard Phillips. I, I don't want to misspeak, but, but let me just let me bring this up here so that you can all see this here. So everyone can see here. This is a biblical theology note. In the creation account of Genesis 1, we read, God said nine times. It was God's word that brought creation into being. So God's word brought it into being. John now tells us that this word is a person who was with God. This statement sheds light on Genesis 1:26, which reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. God was speaking to the word. Another point here. So the word is God's executor in creation, the agent who accomplishes God's will. God said, let there be light and the word made light. All throughout scripture, it is God's word that does God's will. So that's why it's more than just in the, we're going to see, not just creation, but in, as a sustainer. Whenever you see God speaking, declaring, right, even through the prophets, the one who's going to carry out that action is, in fact, Jesus. And so this is, this is not exclusive. This is typical, right? So it's not exclusive to just this one event. It's typical, all right? And so this also clarifies for us in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus is the final word. 
In John 1.1, 1, 1, he is the pre-existent word. As if you were to say, oh, Jesus is, he came to us in the last days. No, 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 no. He's always been there. He's always been working. He's, he's, he is the word, the eternal word of God. Let's see what John says, because I think John answers that. I think he'll answer the question for us. So, so notice here, okay, so big idea. So the big idea, let me just, the, the, the big idea is, if we can imagine, let me just come over here. So this is all commentary on in the beginning, right? Everyone's tracking there with me. Coming back to, coming back to in the beginning, then we have God created the heavens and the earth, right? So now notice in, in John's discussion, look at what we have over here. Now we have uh, God creating. So we have three references here. Were created, was created, has been made. Everyone tracking here? Everyone's there? Everyone's with me? We could, we could think of this as a summary. Summary. Or maybe um, continuing Genesis 1, 1, right? Everyone sees that? So in the beginning, the word was. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were created through him. So now we're going to get to, in this context, the preeminence of the word, which is the word that Danny used, the preeminence, right? So look here now. All things, object, were created, action. And then we have this, this agency here through him. This is the word, okay? Now notice here that there's no reference to God, although he is implied here. Do you see that? It's written in a passive sense. So we could, let's, let's paraphrase this, a paraphrase. God created all things through the word. Everyone tracking there with me? And John could have said that, right? John could have said that, but he chose not to. Because the preeminence, the focus is on the word. Does everyone see that? All things were created through him, the word. So now if we're looking at the preexistence of, uh, of the, the word, this is the, this, the, 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 who the word is, right? Description, describing the word. Now we've moved to the, the work, <laughs> the work of the word. Come on, we can preach this. It's already coming together. Come on. And so here we have the action of the word. Number one, all things were created through him. And this answers the question concerning angels concerning water, all things, all things. So in Genesis 1-1, God created all things. Okay, we could say Genesis 1-1 is like a summary statement. And then Genesis 2 and following are the details. It's not a second creation. It's more details. And we see that there, there isn't a discussion on the origin of angels. It's inconsequential to us. It doesn't, it's not what the Lord wanted us to focus upon. And then and the same is true in John. Doesn't care about angels, right? Hebrews 1, Jesus is so much greater than the angels. <laughs> so the, our preoccupation with angels, you know, I'm not saying anyone here is preoccupied. I'm just saying like our propensity, our desire to be occupied with angels. Maybe it's coming from Satan. Not that we're being led by Satan, but it's just, it's Satan-ish, getting us, detracting us away from the, the focus upon God, focus upon 
his son. Look at this. That, now, th there's a restatement. There's a restatement here. Look here. And without him, again, agency, without the son, not one thing was created. And then if ever there was a, 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 if ever there was a doubt, which had been made. Does everyone see that? There is just this repeating idea, all things. Not one thing was made, which had been made. The word was fundamental, necessary. He is the creator God. And so then this also, this also, so when we talk about the proof of the structure, so we're talking about the structure, this also proves as an argument. Because what it's saying here is that this is the, the creator God. The word is the creator God. So this further supports that the word was God. Only God creates all things, right? And this also separates, this also separates, there's this boundary here. The, the word is not part of creation. So, so even those that'll say, oh, well, he, he, you know, he, he was just created before all things, right? It's like, no, the whole point is that everything that God made, all things were created through the, through the word. And without the word, not one thing was made. How could the word be a thing which has been made? There's three statements here. Action one, action two. Repeat for emphasis. We could even say action three. This is repeat for emphasis. The word is not a created being. He is God himself, but not God the Father. He's revealed God the Father to us. You see, like it's, it's, this passage is probably, I mean, so fun, to, number one of all time, probably as far as what it's fundamentally teach, teaching us concerning the word. Because here it's so strongly declaring that the word is not created. He is, in fact, God. We wouldn't want to create a dichotomy between the two. But here it's the scripture in the technical sense because it's describing the second son of God. But of course, if Jesus is the word of God, he is the living word. Then all of the scripture that was given to us was given to us through him. God gave it through him to us. So he was fundamental in it. And so in, in that sense, yes, we could say that the, the scripture would be included here, but, but technically speaking, it's speaking to that eternal son of God through which then the scripture comes. Are, does that make sense? We want to stress that from the, from the eternal word, comes God's revealed will, who he is and what he calls us to do. And then eventually that's written down for us. Yeah. So if, if I was teaching or preaching this, I would not focus on this being the, 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 the scripture. Okay. Okay. Jesus, if you're, if, if you're preaching or teaching this, I would focus on this being the eternal son of God through which then we are given the scriptures. Okay. And so you wouldn't want to be so, so historically speaking um, in liberal theology and theology, they made a distinction between the living word and the written word. And so they'd say the written word doesn't, isn't God's word. It contains God's word. And, and, and as far as it reveals the son, the, the, the word to us, we don't want to say that at the same time here, the accent and the focus is on the eternal word of God, Jesus Christ, the son of God, refer back to, to, to our discussion on how we can speak of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm speaking of him as all he, all that he is, but, but I don't, I don't, we shouldn't, I would not focus on the written word of God here, but it's not a false, it's not a dichotomy. Okay. One against the other. One produces the other. Maybe that makes sense. One produces the other here. The accent is on the living word. The living word of God produces the written word. I, I hesitate to use the word metaphor when it comes to the word, because, because it is, it is, it is the person. And, and there is a higher level in that terminology than 
than life or light. Um, and people will talk about a metaphor de denying the literalness. Did you see what I'm saying? So I do think that Jesus being, yeah, so it's metaphorical in the sense that it's not, he's not literally just words, like an inanimate, like, like when I'm speaking right now, I mean, it's, it's not, there's no life in those words, right? It's just, it's impersonal. It's, it's a, it's sound, right? When I speak, it's sound coming out. So in that sense, Jesus is, um, is much more than that. Okay. Is everyone tracking there with me? He, he's that second person of the Godhead who is revealing the God to us. And so of course it includes audible sounds and it includes the act of creation. So it's much more than that, though. He's the second person um, um, of the Trinity. Yeah. It, I mean, this is so deep. We're, we're, we're so deep right now. Okay, we're so deep. The reason for the use calling the, the Son of God the Word is, is to make the connection with how he's involved in creation. I, I, so, so there is that work in creation there is that exist that pre-existence. Let's do um let's do one parallel passage. I'll go to one parallel passage so that you can see this, and then we'll get back on point. Okay, you, you guys are taking me you're, you're taking me aside off 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 the beaten path. All right, here we go. Um, we're gonna go to uh, Hebrews four fourteen uh four uh four thirteen. Okay, now this is this is for, uh, four sorry four twelve. Uh, Hebrews four twelve historically in our churches, we always refer to this as being the written word. But if you want to see here, this is both. <laughs> the word of God is both Jesus and the written word. So, 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 so listen to this, okay? The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intents of the heart. The, the, the word of God does that, but also Jesus does that, and no creature is hidden from his sight. Clearly now it's transcending the word to, to Jesus himself, right? But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must all give an account. That's judgment. Does everyone see how it transforms? The word of God is, is the, the, the written word is exposing, but then it's also Jesus. Is, is everyone tracking there with how this, this we could interpret as God's written word, but also the written word doesn't have eyes, doesn't have sight. This is already referring to the word of God, Jesus, the one who we will be judged by. Everyone's tracking there with me. Everyone sees that. I hope you do. Think about that. Look at this here. In him was life. In him was life. So let's write this down. So this is a, again, a, a statement of, of state. We're dealing with location here, and we're dealing with this idea of, of life. Everyone sees that? Who, has, who is the only one who has life in himself? All created beings have to depend on someone else to maintain their life, right? Food. All, all other created beings, food, water, sunlight. But look at this description here. In the word, life was contained in him. So this here describes the, let, let's use this word, self-sufficiency of the word. And this is a God attribute, an attribute of God. So again, it's coming back, baby. It's coming back to the eternal God of the universe in the word was life and the life was the light of mankind. So look at this here now in Genesis two, right? God gave life and he sustains life with the tree of life, right? And other trees of the garden, right? So not only does God give life to man, he also gives the ability for life to be sustained. Right. So, so let's just think here. So let's just look at the parallel. Come on, look at the parallel here. So we have Genesis two, we have God gives life to man. God 
sustains life, right? One, two, John, one, four to five. The word is life, has life in himself, and two, gives life to man. Everyone tracking with the parallel? My goodness. And light takes on greater significance. Light takes on greater significance. Light is from God, not the sun, right? I'm saying the physical sun, right? Light is from God. And so maybe that's fundamentally why when God created, which he did literally, he creates the light separately from the sun, moon, and stars. Light comes from him. He doesn't come from, it doesn't come from these physical objects, true light. And true light is what man needs. So Jesus is life. Jesus, Jesus, the word has life. The word has life. The word gives life. That life is the light of mankind. And so now already, so this is a, this is a second description here. One, two, but already now this is, so look at this here. This is already moving beyond physicality, right? So this is dealing with, this is dealing with spiritual light is not is not physical, it's spiritual, right? Light signifies, so that's the metaphor that, that Bull, Attorney Bull Boy was specifying. Light is, is spirit, it's a spiritual light. He's the one that enlightens us, it illuminates us. And so what is this spiritual? This is the, the knowledge of God. We'll go, we'll go to one parallel passage here. Second Corinthians 4. To one to five. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with the word with God's word, written word, right? But in an open statement of the truth, we would our, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In the case, the God of this world has blinded the minds darkness blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Come on. Who is the image of God for we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We are ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. The God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so here, this is the knowledge of the glory of God. This is the gospel that the eternal son of God was sent to earth to die on the cross for sins. His suffering was his whole life, but culminated and climaxed on the cross where our guilt was imputed to him. The wrath of God was poured out upon him. He perfectly obeyed the law of God. And that, and that obedience, that state of obedience that, that state of righteousness was credited to us. We are brought into union with Christ and, and forevermore for those who believe. And we're, we're given new birth through this Holy Spirit. We are given the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So coming back to this passage here, for us not to see light shining in darkness, the greater spiritual truth is that the word which has life and so this life then we can see is clearly not just physical life. This is eternal life. And that's the truth that John is going to teach us through the proclamation of Jesus's teaching that eternal life is the light of mankind. And this light is shining in darkness. The light is shining, shining in darkness. And so this is spiritual darkness. So already it's moved past the creation event to, to beyond the fall, right? And this is present tense. So everything has been passed, passed, was created, was created, was created, present, is shining. Present tense does not comprehend. Present tense does not understand. Now, translations will have 
overcome. And there's, there's for sure probably truth in there, but, but exegetically is the issue one of, and maybe we want to take a both and approach. Okay. Some people do. So, so overcome, there is a battle between light and darkness, but there's also this understand the word means understand or comprehend. And so this idea here that the darkness does not comprehend, does not understand the light. We have it here. The, there, the world is blinded throughout John's gospel. He will talk about the blinding, that the, the Pharisees remain blind. They have not seen the glory of the sun. And so for, for sure, there's, 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 a, there's a battle, a spiritual battle going on. But there's also this understand or not, really it's not, not understanding the light. Because, so this is to be clear, ignorance. They're in ignorance without the knowledge of God, okay? And so here we have, to conclude, we have the, the description of the word. We have the word as creator. And then we have the word as sustainer and savior sustainer a sustainer and savior okay and this is all fundamental to our understanding of christology and who jesus christ is big picture right and this is all this is all occurring before the incarnation this is all pre-existence, all right? So it's pre-existence. So big idea, and we'll close on this. Number one, the eternal, the, the word of God, the second person of the Trinity, the son of God is the eternal word of God. The one who is the second person of the Trinity, the monotheistic God, one God, three persons. Number two, he is the creator God. He creates all things. Number three, he sustains us and in his grace, he is saving us. He is our light. He is our eternal life. And this is all true prior to the incarnation. There is no way that we can say, oh, th the son of God was created. There's no way we can say, oh, um, he gave up his divinity, right? And so I'll return to John 1, 14. We're going to exp expand this further. So look at this. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen the glory, the glory as of the only son of the father. So people will say became flesh means he gave up his eternality, his divine nature, and became flesh. And the confession doesn't say that. Added. He added flesh. If he gives up, then we haven't seen the only son. We haven't seen his glory. Verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's sign has made him known. If you have seen the word, you have seen the Father. If you've seen the word, he is the Son, you've seen the Father. And so here, we want to stress, though, in our passage for tonight, the eternality of the word, the second person of the Trinity. And so we'll return to John 1 later this semester. Um, and so in the creation event, Jesus Christ was working as the word of God.